If you have your Bibles, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse number 8. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. There's nothing like the Word of God. It's quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. There's nothing like the Word of God. This is what the Word of God says, 1 Peter 5 and 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. Because... Your adversary. Everybody say my adversary. You want to take ownership of the blessings of God. You also got to take ownership of your enemy. He's not just your neighbor's enemy. He's your enemy. Your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Simon, Simon, Satan hath desired you that he may sift you as wheat. What a compliment. What a compliment that the enemy would be frightened by you enough to be your enemy. Before we get done here today, we're going to leave with a newfound appreciation for every adversary and every enemy in our lives. I know that may seem hard to believe when you're looking at the enemy in the face right now. But before the Holy Ghost gets finished, we're going to leave with gratitude for our enemy. The Holy Ghost is about to help somebody here today. I want to talk to you about an absent adversary. An absent adversary. Would you lay your Bibles down and let's lift our hands and our voices and call unto Him all over this house. By the authority of the Word of God, the power of the name of Jesus, I come against every resistance to this church service, both natural and spiritual. I speak to this atmosphere right now, and I command the winds of the Spirit to begin to blow. I speak to every dead thing to come back to life. I speak to every sickness, I command it to be healed. I speak to every burden I command it to be lifted. I speak to every bondage and addiction I command it to be broken right now. In the only saving name of Jesus Christ. God, you are that spirit and where the spirit of the Lord is. There is liberty. And I speak liberty in this house right now. Come on, somebody ought to open up your mouth and just speak liberty. You ought to declare it into this atmosphere until you feel freedom all over this house. Praise God. Let's clap our hands unto Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. <clears throat> In April of 2016, a man by the name of Ed Young released an article with National Geographic stating that birds on a specific island are losing their ability to fly. He makes note that 
Before the arrival of humans, New Zealand was an ideal haven for birds to gather. And he said that without ground predators to bother them, many of the local species lost the ability to fly. These birds were part of a pattern that played out across the world's islands that wherever predators are kept away by expanses of water, birds become flightless quickly and repeatedly. This happened on more than a thousand independent occasions which produced the club-winged ibis of Jamaica and the flightless cormorant of the Galapagos Islands. Ed Young said that the call of the ground is a strong one and it exists even when the skies are still an option because mediocrity will never stop calling you just because greatness is available. Natalie Wright from the University of Montana demonstrated this by collecting data on 868 different species. She showed that even when island birds can still fly, they are gradually and slowly edging toward flightlessness. Because compared to their mainland relatives, their muscles are smaller and their legs are longer. Because without an enemy, they have grown accustomed to the atmosphere down here rather than striving for the atmosphere up there. And across nine major groups of birds with a wide range of lifestyles and body shapes, Wright found a common thread among them all. On smaller islands with fewer species and no predators, with no enemies, with no adversaries, Birds have shifted their energy from their forelimbs to their hind limbs, creating smaller flight muscles and longer legs. And to her surprise, the trend even applied to hummingbirds for whom flying is an essential part of life. Flight is not negotiable for the survival of a hummingbird. And I found that interesting, Wright noted that a flightless hummingbird is a dead hummingbird. She went on to state that it's easy to see why a diving bird like a cormorant or a ground-dwelling bird might lose its ability to fly in the absence of predators. But she posed the question, why should a hummingbird who is constantly in flight have to sacrifice some of its ability to fly? Why should it have to lose some of its aerial prowess? And she answered her own question by concluding that flight muscles come with a cost because there is a price to pay if you desire to be elevated. Even at rest, larger flight muscles require more energy to maintain. Large flight muscles are especially useful when birds take off from the ground because that is the most energetically demanding part of flying and also the piece of their body that is most important for escaping ground predators. If such predators are absent, birds can take off at a more leisurely pace and they can afford to have smaller flight muscles because without an enemy, there is no urgency in them to be elevated and reach the next level. So to parallel the animal kingdom, the spiritual kingdom should consider that in the absence of an adversary, these birds live an easy life, but they do not live an elevated life. 
And Wright's results from her study suggest that highland birds might be more vulnerable to predators than anyone expected. And even those birds that can fly are not as good at flying as their mainland relatives. Uh, ultimately, Wright concluded that islands without predators, uh, islands without adversaries create birds uh, that never leave islands uh, because these birds have no adversary they lose the ability to reach new heights uh, and possess new territories uh, in other words without an adversary they can never reach the level that God created for them to reach and I have come to preach about your adversary, the devil, who is a roaring lion that walks about seeking whom he may devour. I came to preach about that hated thing in your life. I came to preach about that feared thing in your life. I came to preach about that thing that causes tears to flow. I came to preach about that thing that causes you to live with anxiety and worry and stress and fear. I came to preach about that problem that you wish was not a part of your life. You better be thankful today there's an adversary because it is that adversary that is pushing you beyond mediocrity into a level you would never reach otherwise. Come on, I have come to awaken somebody's spirit and say you were not created to settle for an earthly dimension. You were created to soar in a heavenly dimension. This church was not created for dead church or dead youth groups or dead prayer meetings or dead preaching or dead singing or empty altars and dry baptistries. You were not created for an earthly dimension. You were created for for a heavenly dimension. Would somebody shout in this house and say thank God for every enemy that is pushing me beyond mediocrity. That's why you don't ever need to settle for less than your created purpose. You don't need to settle for anything less than what God has for your life. Isaac was the son of promise in whom the Abrahamic covenant would continue. But Abraham had an Ishmael. Abraham had a mistake. And Sarah saw the conflict between past and promise and she looked at the problem and she said, cast him out because he is mocking my promise. They tried to get rid of what seemed to be an adversary and Hagar laid her son Ishmael under a tree and left him there to die. But what they did not understand is that the pain that Ishmael brought could not die because the pain of Ishmael was necessary for the promise of Isaac. And so God spoke in Genesis 21 and 18 and said, lift up the lad, elevate the pain, elevate the problem, and hold him in thine hand, for I will make of him a great nation. God told her to lift up the lad. He wanted to take what was causing Abraham a problem and bring it to a higher level and so the question here today is if the Arab nations would come from the seed of Ishmael and he would always be an enemy to Isaac why not just let him die under the tree that Hagar left him under why would God promote the very thing that was causing Abraham pain it is because God understood this enemy is not preventing your promise this enemy is provoking in your promise. God did not lift up Ishmael to lift up Ishmael, but he lifted up Ishmael so Ishmael could lift up Isaac. And there are people in this room, you're asking God to take away the pain, take away the problem, take away the enemy, but God understands this enemy is gonna elevate you. This enemy is gonna bring you to a higher level than you have ever been before. When God lifts
lifts your adversary, your adversary's about to lift you. I wish I had some help in here this morning. When God promotes your problem, your problem is about to promote you. There ought to be somebody jump to their feet and prophesy to your problem and say, you're about to lift me higher than you ever thought I would go. Ah, Sarah looked around and said, let's get rid of Ishmael. And you are asking God to get rid of what is causing you pain. But God is letting it stay so that it can lift you to a higher level. Why? Because without it, God knows that you would get comfortable. You see, your pain is the very thing that is causing you to be dependent on God. Can I tell you, if God lets your issues stay, it's because God can do more through you with it than he can without it. Uh, without that problem you'd get stagnant, you'd get comfortable, and you'd be satisfied with where you are. But because of that enemy, it's driving you back to the altar. It's driving you back to prayer. It's driving you back to the house of God. And when this enemy is defeated, there will be an anointing on your life uh, that will shake the gates of hell. Somebody shout in this house right now. It's not over until God says that it's over. Come on, praise him in this house right now. Praise him in this house. I feel in the Holy Ghost that the reason some of you are hesitant to receive this word is because of condemnation and shame and a mistake in your life. You've got an Ishmael in your life that was a mistake. Sarah did not want the mistake robbing the inheritance of the promise. But can I encourage somebody and say, if a failure drives you to an altar, it is that failure that will help you fly what you thought would in you uh, is the very thing that is going to elevate you. Uh, your sin is still sin. Uh, but when you repent, your sin can help you soar. There ought to be somebody in this house uh, that makes up in their mind, uh, God is not done uh, with my life. Yes, I failed, uh, but rejoice not against me, oh my enemy. Come on, is anybody in this house blood bought, born again, sanctified in the name of Jesus Christ? Yes, you failed, but watch me fly. Yes, you sinned, but the enemy's about to watch you soar. Anybody feel faith rising in this house right now? And so if you ever wonder what it's like for your adversary to be absent, the answer is it would be easy, but you'd never be elevated. You see, David had an adversary called a lion and a bear. And a lion and a bear led to a Goliath. And Goliath led to a Saul with a javelin in a cave. You see, his adversary was not sent to anoint him. His adversary was sent to advance him. It was the prophet that anointed David, but it was the problem that promoted David. And there are people in this room, you've got an anointing, but where you are in the spirit does not match that anointing. It is because God has anointed you, but there's been no adversary to promote you. Too many people have an anointing they don't operate in because they don't have anything to provoke them into their potential. Hey, Joseph, I know you've got the interpretation of the dream, but you don't have the fulfillment of the dream. So I got to put you in the pit. And after the pit, you got to go to Potiphar's house. And after Potiphar's house, you got to go to the prison. And after
after the prison, I'll elevate you to the palace. And when his brothers looked at him and said, we didn't know that this was going to happen. We tried to kill you and we failed. He looked back at his brothers and said, you thought evil against me, but what you meant for evil, he turned it around and used it for the glory of God. There ought to be somebody jump up and just turn in your seat right now. He's about to turn it around. You know what Job was saying? You know what Joseph was saying? He was saying, if you didn't want me in the palace, you should have never let me go to the pit. But because you provoked me, I'm about to be greater than you ever thought I would be. Can somebody run these aisles on a Sunday morning and say, thank God for the enemy. Thank God for the adversary. Somebody ought to say, if she's going to run the aisles, I'm going to run the aisles. If you can't run with two legs, God help us in this house right now. You know why some of you won't shout? Because you don't know what it's like to fight a devil. But for those of us that have fought the enemy, we refuse to be quiet. We're going to dance in the middle of our devil's mess. Somebody ought to say, when I think uh, of the goodness of Jesus uh, and all that he's done for me, my soul's got to cry out. Thank God that he healed my body. Thank God that he fixed my marriage. Uh, Thank God that he brought my kids back. I want you to lift your voice and shout as loud as you can in this house right now. And so the Bible said, Jesus looked around and he said, if I be lifted up, if I'm elevated, I'll draw all men unto me. But Paul wrote to the church of Corinth and said, had the princes of this world known who they were crucifying, they would have never crucified the Lord of glory. But you know what Jesus did? He said, go ahead and pluck my beard. Go ahead and beat me at the whipping post. Go ahead and nail me to the cross. Go ahead and place the crown of thorns on my head. Go ahead and feed me the vinegar. Go ahead and stick the spear in my side. Go ahead and put me in a borrowed tomb. But if you didn't want me to get up from the grave, you should have left me in the garden. There ought to be somebody that puts the devil in his place. If you didn't want me to shout, you should have never messed with my family. If you didn't want us to have revival, you should have never messed with our youth group. If you didn't want me to be anointed, you should have never messed with my health. Come on, somebody. You ought to get out of your seat and dance on a Sunday morning and let the devil know my dance is about to be greater. My shout is about to be greater. My clap is about to be greater. Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. The Holy Ghost is waiting on somebody to get out of their seat and run to this altar in this house right now and say, God, thank you for every enemy I fought. Thank you for every adversary in my life.
If you've ever fought an enemy, you ought to be out of your seat around this altar. If you've got a devil in your life, you ought to be out of your seat around this altar. And if you don't want to respond to the word of God, maybe it's because you're who I'm preaching to. You don't have an enemy in your life. But there will come a day you're face to face with a devil in your life. And you're going to say, thank God for the adversary. Lift your voice as loud as you can. Come on. Come on, I'm done. I'm done. As they sing, I want you to lift your voice and just give God praise for every diagnosis, for every valley you've had to walk through, for every storm you've had to endure, for every battle you've had to fight. Come on, lift your voice in this house oh, right now. Thank up your God voice for the atmosphere. Joy. Clap your hands, make a joyful noise. Blow the trumpet and shout. We'll praise Him for the victory. Listen to me for just a moment. Sometimes what you possess is not always determined by what you pursue. Sometimes it's determined by what you're trying to escape. Moses wasn't looking for a burning bush. He was just trying to run from Pharaoh. But because he was running from an enemy, it pushed him into a God moment. Jacob wasn't looking for an angel to wrestle with. He was just trying to get away from Esau. And because he was trying to escape an enemy, it pushed him into a God moment. Some of you are here today, and if you're honest, you're not even really looking for God. You're just trying to escape a mess. You're trying to escape a broken home. You're trying to escape depression. You're trying to escape addiction. You're trying to escape a past. You're trying to escape an addiction. You're trying to escape sin and shame and bondage. But as you run from that, you're about to run into the presence of the one that can satisfy your soul. But there comes a point where a bird takes off from the ground running from an adversary and he reaches a point of transition where he gets to a certain level and he transitions from being the prey to becoming the predator where he reaches a certain level and he transitions from being the victim to being the victor Some of you are right at that point. You're running from something. God's going to deliver some people from a victim mindset in this room here today. You are not a victim. You are a victor. You are more than a conqueror. You are an overcomer. You are the head and not the tail. You are above and not beneath. 
Come on, you are blessed and not cursed. You are up and not down. I was in a revival. This is what I'm going to leave you with. I was in a revival several years ago. I finished preaching and there was a prophet in that service. I went and sat down and he leaned over and he said, Brother Herring, the Lord just showed me a vision. And I feel it's applicable here today. He said, in this vision, I saw a bunch of birds that had bandages wrapped around their wings. He said their heads were hung, their countenance was stooped because of old wounds that had never healed. He said, I heard a voice say, fly. And when those birds heard that voice, they looked at their wings and all they could see was the bandages and the wounds. And they hung their head. And he said in the vision, I heard that voice again say, just try. He said, all of a sudden, those birds lifted their heads and they began to flap those wings. And as they began to flap those wings, bandages fell off of their wings. And they realized those wounds that had bandages have finally healed. Some of you are hesitant to try and pursue the next level in your relationship and in your ministry and in your walk with God because of old wounds that you don't think have healed. But the Holy Ghost sent me by here to tell you, just try. Just try. Every hand raised, every eye closed. I'm going to pray the prayer of faith. If you don't have the Holy Ghost, God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Altar workers, I want you flowing through this crowd, looking for people that need the gift of the Holy Ghost. When I count to three, I want you to lift your voice and they're going to sing. I want you to shout with victory in this house. We're not going to mope around like we're defeated, like we're the prey, like we're the victim. We're going to lift our voice in victory. Are you ready? By the authority of the Word of God and the power of the name of Jesus, I lose the gift of faith in this room right now. I come against every victim mindset and I speak victory into every situation. God, I speak fresh anointing over every individual in this room. I speak deliverance from bondage. I speak healing from sickness. In the name of Jesus, are you ready? One. Two, three, shout in this house. Lift up Fly. your voice and Fly. shout for joy. Clap your hands.